you grab your Bibles and uh, turn to the book of Exodus again. Exodus, your Bible is chapter number 16. Now on the table in front of you, there are two pieces of paper. If you didn't mind, grab those as well. One says a 90-day tithe challenge, and the other one is this little card like this. So just have all that there. This is now my second stewardship banquet that I have preached. First as pastor. Last year I preached in transition as co-pastor. Pastor was gone this day, and, and I had the privilege of preaching it. There is not much, there is not much that I could do to raise a lot of money. There are some people who are very good at it. Uh, There are some people who have the gift of emotion. They do it on TV too. You see those things that that they want you to give toward the starving children in some third world country. What do they play? Just sad pictures, right? Picture after picture of wide-eyed droopy-eyed children, emaciated, so that your heart is touched and you just instantly grab your phone or your computer or the number and call and, and give and give and give. Or or how about for, for poor homeless dogs? You see this dog and your heart just like, oh, that dog needs a home. And just for $5, for five, less than the cost of a Starbucks coffee, every dog in this poor forsaken world could have a friend. And people give millions. Give millions. I should have brought pictures. <laughs> poor children, poor animals. But that's not the point of stewardship, man. That's not the point. The point is not so that, boy, what else can we do at First Baptist Church? Who else can we reach? How many more missionaries can we send? And what other ministries can we fund here? That's not the point. All right, we will do with what God gives to us. We'll support who we think we ought to support. and We'll have the ministries we ought to support. So why do we have stewardship? If, Pastor Howell, you're a terrible money raiser. Because it's part of being a good Christian. I brought a couple of testimonies that were written down. One says this, I was challenged to tithe by a Sunday school teacher as a teenager. I have tithed most of my adult life. God has always met my needs when I was unable to pay for both girls to attend camp. I prayed and someone paid the fee for them, for one of the girls. He still always provides for me. God meets needs before I know what I need. God is so good to me. That testimony could be repeated over and over and over again. Could it not? By your amens, you had that experience where God has provided for you. When we got married 15 years ago, we were committed to tithing. The Lord has blessed us. The Lord has been so good to us. We've never been in want, and our family grew. The Lord continued to bless us and provide all our needs. Or this one, God sent his son Jesus to give all so that I can have a relationship and a home in heaven with him. God wants me to give all that I have for him to use. God gave us the sun that gives, the moon that gives, the air that gives, the plants that give, the water that gives. Who am I not to have a heart of giving? 2 Corinthians 12, 15 says, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. A heart of giving. Stewardship Month is not about the church finances. The doors, with God's grace, will remain open tomorrow. Stewardship is about us and our walk with God and our view of what we have and whose it is. You see, what I have is not mine, or I should believe it's not mine. I read that quote last week, and uh, this, uh, I don't think I read this morning, but someone said this, Everything I've held on to tightly, I've lost. That which I've given to him, I've kept. Who said that? Corey Ten Boom, a Jewish Holocaust survivor. The heart of giving. If you have your Bibles, Exodus chapter number 16. I won't be long, but I'll tell you what, after good food and some good singing like that, I could preach for an hour and be okay. But don't get nervous. Didn't get too many amens right there, did I? But, um, <laughs> about a week and a half ago, I was reading my devotions in Exodus chapter number 16, maybe two weeks ago now. And I came across a familiar a familiar provision from God. Children of Israel, Exodus, where they've been released from bondage in Egypt. And I came across this thing, and it's, it's like God spoke to me again about what God did and what I think can help us today. 
Exodus chapter 16, the children of Israel have already gone through the ten plagues. And they've been released from Egypt. They've already, they've already gone through the Red Sea. They've already seen their enemies destroyed. In fact, some of the battle cries that they may have been shouting as they went, no more bondage, no more taskmasters, no more enemies. But they began a new cry in Exodus chapter 16, and this, the cry was this, no more food. No more bondage, no more taskmasters, no more slavery, no more enemies. But now they have run out of food. And instantly, and you know the children of Israel, those of you who have been around the Bible more than a few days, know that the children of Israel quickly began to complain. They quickly began to uh, criticize Moses and the Lord. God, you've let us down. You've brought us into the wilderness to die. You know, in 2020, our minds still work the exact same way. Oh, that's right. God's not going to provide for me now. But this consumer's bill, I have no way of paying, and, and I'm not going to be able to pay it. They're going to turn off my gas, and, and I will die, and I'll lose my house, and I won't have a job. That's where our minds go, isn't it? Unfortunately. Lord, you've let me down now. It's almost like we think that God is perched up in heaven, waiting up for us to make one misstep. It's like we view sometimes God in this way, a very wrong way, that we may live for God, but the moment we take one wrong misstep, that God, boom, gotcha. And that's not the view of God at all. That's not what God does, nor is that a correct view of God's provision for us. You see what happened was the children would begin complaining. Even though God had done so much, they complained. Even after the great victories, they, uh, they complained. And even after the provision, because think about this, when they left Egypt... This is before the big offering. They had clothes and jewels and gold and money. They were not broke. Just like a teenager goes to the, the fridge and says, Mom, there's nothing to eat in the house. <laughs> Neth is the acronym. N-E-T. Nothing to eat in this house. Neth. What are we really saying? There's nothing that we want to eat in this house. Oh, we have plenty of food. We throw away more food than any other country. Right? In fact, the other day I saw this, this new fridge uh, for the small price of 10, was it tiny, $10,000? $10,000. And it has a thing that recirculates the air so it keeps your food fresh longer. You can save $2,000 a year in food in your fridge. Now, one, I don't have 10000 bucks for a refrigerator. But it was a... Interesting number that they said that we waste two thousand dollars of food just from our refrigerators. Not even what your kids throw away, or we throw away McDonald's. And yet, after all this provision, the children of Israel began to complain. And in Exodus chapter sixteen, God does something amazing. He sends manna. Can you imagine waking up that morning, walking outside, and saying, "Manna, what is this?" <coughs> This is interesting. We've never seen this before. And some idiot ate it. There's always one in every crowd. Hey, this isn't bad. Most of us aren't the first ones to eat it, right? Hey, Joey, give you five bucks. I'll give you my gold earring you that day right there. Oh, yeah. This is great. Acts chapter 16. If you look in verse number 11, and the Lord's making to Moses saying, I have heard the murmuring, just the complainings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall flash in the morning, ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that was lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoar of frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, It is manna. For they wished it not what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Tremendous, tremendous provision. And like I mentioned this morning, in a way they had never seen done before. I'm gonna have I'm gonna have it snow manna. I'm gonna have it rain and manna. Whatever happened, this manna ends up on the ground every single day. God had never done this before, and to my knowledge, has never done it since. It would be pretty amazing. 
But I noticed something when I was reading this. I, I, I know it about the complaining. I knew it, I know it about the murmurings. and know it about man. I mean, if I say man, most of us know what that is or some reference of that. But if you look in verse 16, all right, um, something happened about the man that caught my attention. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating. In over for every man, according to the number of your persons, take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses. What a surprise. What a surprise. But some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. And they gathered in every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass that on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said to them, this is that which the Lord hath said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath of the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seed that ye will seed. And that which remaineth over, lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning, and Moses bade, and he did not stink. Neither was there any worm therein. Now we would slide down to verse 36 and Moses, or verse 32. And Moses said, This is a thing which the Lord commanded, till an owner of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put an owner full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. It was a testimony example. The Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years, and though they came to a land inhabited, they did eat manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. A couple of things I, that caught me that morning. The last verse says, Now Omer is the tenth part of an ephah. How much is that? About nine cups. About nine cups. Everybody got about nine cups. Figure nine cups of Wheaties. Nine cups of Rice Krispies, nine cups of flour, about nine cups. But I was reading a couple weeks ago when I caught this and knowing, of course, it was Stewardship Month. A couple of things caught me and struck me as I began to study about this passage about manna. Number one, the children of Israel were complaining God brought provision. But then God laid down some very strict guidelines. God did not just say, hey, here's the manna, do whatever you want with it. He said, you know what, gather an omer for every man. He was strict about what he expected with this manna. If they gathered too much and kept it overnight, what happened? It spoiled. They couldn't beat the system. They could hide it, they could bury it, but they could not beat the system. It always spoiled for six days out of the week. What if they waited till 1 o'clock in the afternoon? You catch that? It melted. It melted. You ever thought about that? They had to get up, get out of the tent. Honey, let's get up out of the tent and get the daily provision gathered. If they waited, if they were lazy, they weren't eating that day. They weren't. So if they weren't doing their part, then God had their own consequences. If they said, you know, I want to gather one day and I'm done for the week, God says that's not going to work that way. It's going to be a regular thing that you have to do. You know that sometimes when God asks those things of us, we start to complain about the about the stipulations. <laughs> Why do I have to do it early in the morning? That's not fair. I don't want to have to gather early. I want to, I'm not a morning person. I'm an afternoon person. I'm an evening person. God says that's fine, but it's going to melt. Understand that eventually the children of Israel will complain about God's provision, about manna. But God, it's not fair that you would have stipulation on your gift to me. How about I tell you what I should do with what you give to me? Isn't that what we do with our money, though? God, it's not fair that you should have an expectation on me with what you give to me. I should be able to tell you what you do with what you do to me. It's convoluted thinking, is it not? So the visual, they had some stipulations, really strict guidelines, really strict guidelines for a gift. What if our Christmas presents were under this, these same guidelines? 
Here's your presents, but you must open them between here and here. If you don't, they all explode. <laughs> That's not fair. They're my gift. Let me do what I want to with them. Yet God brought a gift of manna. And a really strict guideline for everyone. Everyone. Everyone was under the same guideline. Didn't matter how old you were or how young you were. It was the same. But then I thought of something when I got to verse 35. For 40 years, the Bible says, God provided manna. Think about this. Every morning, you got up and had to trust God. You had nothing left over from the day before except for the Sabbath day. Every other day when you got up, if God failed you, you were going hungry. If God failed you, your stomach was going to hurt that day. There'd be no food in it. If God fails you, you're going to have the energy you needed that day. And every single day for 40 years, you had to get up, open your tent. And God's still faithful every single day. But it goes deeper than that. Parents, for 40 years, you had to trust that God would let your kids have provision every day as well. Every single day. I know as a parent, I'll, I will sacrifice stuff for myself for the kids, as parents will do. But every day for 40 years, is God faithful today? It's there. Is God faithful today? It's there. Is God faithful today? It's there. Is God faithful today? It's there for 40 years or over 14,000 days. For 2,828 Sabbaths, God proved himself to be faithful. Because over 2,028 times, you had the trust that tonight it would not rot. That tonight there would be no worms. You see, it was a lesson in trust for God. A lesson of God's faithfulness. I have a question for you. After the first week, do you think it was easier to trust God? After the first year, do you think you wondered that much when you went out the tent? Or you expect it to be there? After year 38 and 49 weeks, when you open a tent, of course it's going to be there. Because God is faithful and we have seen it for 40 years. You know what you find out is you trust God? He is just as faithful today and he'll be just as faithful 40 years from now. When you start to give to God and, and you trust him with your finances, you'll find out that he is faithful. And at first, it may be the open the door. It's still there. It's still there. After 40 years, of course it's still there. God hasn't failed me yet. And for 40 years, they got to see a real-life illustration about God's faithfulness. Why should we give? It's all His. That's all we get from Him. From him. Why should we give? Because God is faithful. It's all God, so anything he asks is okay. If he wanted them to dance a jig when they got the manna, would that have been fine? If he wanted them to say certain words, would that have been fine? So if he asks for us, from us 10%, is that fine? Absolutely. The lady's husband had open heart surgery. She received a letter saying her husband inherited $1 million dollars. She was worried about her husband receiving this news, so she called her pastor and asked him to tell the good news to her husband. The pastor went to the hospital and he said, Joe, if you were to have a one million dollars, what would you do? And the man responded, well, pastor, I'd give it to you. The pastor fell over with a heart attack. <laughs> Listen, the longer you trust God, the more you'll see his faithfulness. Stories told of a man who had a horrible dream. He said, I dreamed that the Lord took my Sunday offering and multiplied it by ten, and this became my weekly income. In no time, I lost my possessions, my new car, and couldn't make my house payment. After all, what can a fellow do on ten dollars a week? <laughs> the Lord took our offering, multiplied it by ten, and made it your weekly income. How much would you make? I have a couple pictures I want to show you tonight, or this afternoon, I should say. Pastor, if you can get those. There's two pictures that I took in Ghana, and I wanted to save them for this particular time. The first one is the outside of the Summers Church. 
and it is a it is a nice building for Ghana. You can see I'm in the compound, and uh, the door right in the middle there is where you kind of walk in. That's the back door, right in the middle, and then the front door is right by the, where the where uh, Pastor John was standing. Um, there's no electricity inside that building. They got it wired up with a battery for their lights, and they love it. They thought of it themselves. They have a battery there. They connect the two light bulbs there, and they take it home when it dies, and they recharge it. Not the summers, the men of the church do that. There is no plumbing at this church. I had to use the restroom two Sundays ago. But I said, so and so, where can I go to the bathroom? They said, yes, sir. Said, yes, sir. Over there. So I walked over there, around the edge of the building, and there was my bathroom. Now, if I said that to some of you, you would have a fit. An absolute fit. You have a fit if, if there's no, if, if not every single sink has all the right soap at it. <laughs> that morning, I took a little picture from my wife and said, hey, I'm in the bathroom. I snapped this out of the wall and sent it back to my wife. <laughs> Inappropriate, probably, but humorous. <laughs> Yet you walk into that church and they have just a joyful time. A giving spirit. Because giving is not about how much you have. It's about here. I have one more picture that you can see, Pastor Don't Thanks. Right there, there's the church, there's the inside. And I took it not for the people, I took it for the blue chairs. Because the blue chairs, the church people paid for themselves. John's been very wise. We obviously support the missionaries. And they have to be careful because obviously they could do some of these things, but the church needs to do them. The church actually pays the rent for this. Pastor John does not pay the rent for it. The chairs cost about a tenth of a month salary, he told me. Of a month. Take your salary. Do a tenth of it. And they did that carefully and bought those chairs, which by my recollection, they said would cost about $18 to $20 a piece in Ghana. Look at all them chairs. You see them down there? And they go back in the back too. A tenth of a month. And there's not that many adult males and there are females to make the money. So some people bought multiple chairs. Willing to give. I was touched by that. I'll tell you why. It's for a chair. It's for a chair. They viewed their chairs as gifts. You, view, you, you and I view soft chairs as a, as a necessity. We used to have metal chairs in this, in this gymnasium. Metal chairs, people would come up regularly. Pastor, these chairs are broken. Kind of laying a little bit. With the idea, like, hey, Pastor, get on this. You got to get these chairs fixed. I can't sit in here in this broken chair like that. And they look taking a tenth of their month's salary to get chairs for their church. The heart of giving. I love the fact, though, it's not about what we need as a church. It's about what he gave. Yes. Amen. I hope that you have a heart of giving. In your hand or near your, your, your place there, you should have two pieces of paper. In a minute, we're going to pray and ask the Lord's help. And I would ask you to pray about two things. The first one is some of you have maybe have never, never began to tithe before, to give 10% of your income. We have their 90-day tithe challenge. Listen, if you've never begun to tithe, I don't want you for a moment to be, in a sense, embarrassed. To think, uh-oh, if someone finds out I never tithe, what will they think of me? Because, if I can be quite frank with you, people around it, that's the last thing you should be worried about. That is what he thinks. The second thing, if someone's not making the right decision, and then they begin to make the right decision, what is our typical response at First Baptist Church? Praise the Lord, is it not? Is someone who wasn't saved, got saved, do we say, boy, you should have been saved before? If someone wasn't baptized and got baptized, what do we do? We clap. If someone who wasn't surrendered to, to the Lord, then surrendered their life to the Lord, what do we do? We're excited for them. Amen. There's no context that you should be ashamed. If someone said, listen, Pastor, i got to admit, I've, I've never been tithe, I've been too afraid. Then would you take the 90 day tithe challenge without fear, without anyone thinking, listen, what will they think of me? 
And I have not looked at giving records. I do not know in this building who ties and who doesn't tie. Even if I happened to look at the giving records, I wouldn't know that because I don't know what you mean. But this is about God, not about me. So if you've never begun to tithe, I would encourage you to look at that 90-day tithe challenge and take the challenge, once again, not for my sake, not for the sake of First Baptist Church, but for your sake and God's sake. The other card is if God has maybe touched you and you would increase your weekly giving. I would ask if you already give, if everyone can fill out this second card. And if the uh, maybe you're not increasing your weekly giving at all, that's all right. That's between you and the Lord. Once again, I'd be a terrible person to raise money. I have no pictures of, of sad dogs or sad children. But that'll help us with a budget for First Baptist Church. And if you say, I'm not increasing anything, that's fine. You, you see, there's no place for a name on there. You see that? There's no place for a name on the, on the increasing thing. It doesn't matter. But if God leads you to increase, write that down, and then you, what your total weekly giving would be that'll help us. But I would just ask that you ask the Lord what to do. That's who we answer to. Not to me, not to people around you. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for what you give and have given to us. Lord, you are so good. Your provision is never failing. But show the visual, saw it, Lord. We see it in your word. I've seen it in my life. I know that we could give testimony after testimony of folks in this room who have been touched by your faithfulness. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to be honest with what we have and what you have. I would encourage you just a minute now with, with our heads bowed and maybe begin, begin to pray and ask God what he would have you to do. If the Lord's touched you then and you want to, and if you'd be willing to fill out those, those things, if you never began to tithe, to take the 90 tithe challenge, I would encourage you to do that. Or if you're going to increase your giving or if in, in general you give, we can have that number as well. That would be tremendous. If you fill those out for us in just a moment, we'll have an offering. Let's just take a moment and talk to the Lord about that.